if you need me to slow down, just let me know. I mean, I, I just have this tendency in this section to go really fast. So if you need me to slow down, just ask questions. So I'll just start with this what if question. Look at this apparatus on the right. Uh, which tube has the greatest force in it? Like if you measured the force at the bottom here, I'll do that. I'll do it in the red. If you measure, measure the force underneath each one of these, you know, like the weight of the liquid, which one has the greatest weight? The fourth one, right? If you go one, two, three, four, the fourth one, this is the most mass. So tube four. What do you assume about the pressure in each tube, though? Huh? Okay, let me ask you, let's, let's put the hypothetical. Let's say the pressure in the first tube was higher. What would happen? There's more pressure, more There we go. It's all connected, right? It has more pressure. Yeah, so it's like first you see uh, there's that, right? And then there's that, which one has more pressure. Well that one, right? Because clearly there's a lot of mass on top of the surface area. But but what do we what do we oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Double click my mouse pointer. Quick stop it. Um what do we know about the pressure in these things? All the same. Pressure in all these is the same because if there's more pressure in one of the tubes than the other, it would push down, right? Isn't that weird? It's because when we're talking about pressure, pressure is actually force divided by an area. And even though there's uh, more force on the one on the right, the cross-sectional area is proportional to that force, and so that it all kind of cancels out. And really, the pressure is exerted directly by the column of liquid that's above. So some of the stuff that's off to the side doesn't exert the pressure towards the bottom. So anyways, having said that, it's only the vertical length of the pressure that matters. The stuff that is angled to the side, that force doesn't add to that total. Not in the same way. Uh, no, but force. Um, actually, so how does this force? Force is related to mass. Huh? Yeah, it's ma It's it was mass time acceleration, right? So, is what it is. But um, yeah, let's not get into that. It's not the same thing, but they're related. But if the, if the force gets bigger, if the mass gets bigger, but the cross-sectional size gets bigger at the same rate, like the area, right, then it cancels out. Okay. Right? It's all the same. Okay, so when we think about gas pressure, and that's really what, I mean, we talk about liquid pressures because you can see liquids, you can't really see gases that well. But when we're talking about gas pressure, um, we're talking about the force that's exerted uh, by gas molecules. Right? And when you have a gas molecule and it's moving, right, you don't think about this. Like, it doesn't exert a pressure in the middle of the container if there's nothing there. In order for a gas molecule to exert a pressure, it has to run into something to exert a pressure on it. Because unless you transfer that force, right? And so, for Unless you transfer that force, then there's no like area for the pressure. So as long as it's freely moving, it's kind of weird to think about it. The gas molecules themselves aren't exerting pressure. But if you're a gas molecule, you run into a wall, right? Like think about what how it feels when you run into a wall. Like the last night you ran into a wall. Might have been the last night in the middle of the night with the bathroom or whatever it is, right? That's pressure. What you're feeling when you hit. While you're walking, you're not feeling anything. But when you hit the wall, right, that's pressure. And so like a ball, right, that exerts a force when it bounces against a wall. Gas atoms exert force when they collide with the surface. The same equation still applies. 
But this force right, is the net force of all, all the particles. And this is the area in which they're contained within. So like a balloon, it's the force of all the balloon, the gases in the balloon, hitting the walls of the balloon, and the area is that inside the wall. So that's the surface being struck. So kind of armed with that. I want to do this next thing first, actually. So um, I thought this slide was second and this one was first. I, I, I even looked at it that way when I reviewed it just before class. So imagine you have two jars, right? And they're at the same temperature right now. And I have uh, gas molecules on the left and gas molecules on the right. You, you see how the one on the left has lower pressure? Mole, it turns out pressure depends on the number of moles. So if you increase and increase moles and you leave everything else the same, but you don't change the temperature, you don't change the volume, right? what ha happens to the pressure? It goes up, right? It increases. Now, why does it increase? Yeah, there's just more molecules bouncing, right? And so as the molecules bounce against the wall, if there's just more of them, right, increased collision is what causes Increase in pressure. Now think about volume, okay? So just say you take the jar on the left. I, you can't do this because it's a glass jar. But what if you made, you kept everything else the same, right? And you made the jar smaller. <laughs> now think about it. If I kept everything else the same except for I made the jar smaller, the pressure would be higher, right? Because they don't have to travel as far. They have changed their speed. They don't have to travel as far. So you get more collisions per unit area just because there's more of it, right? Again, the collisions with the wall increases because you got them closer together. Okay. So same as, um, same reason as, as moles, but if you make the volume smaller, what you find is that the pressure increases because you have more collisions. Higher pressure. And really what this relates most to is density. That's what the slide is. If you increase the density of a gas inside of a container, the pressure is higher. If you increase the density of a gas inside a container, it's lower. And gases, unlike solids and liquids, you can change the volume of a gas and the number of moles inside the container. You can change the density very easily, so densities change a lot. Is there ever a limit? How well, yeah, if you, if real gases, if you compress them enough, you, them. Oh, yeah. you push them all together and they become a real liquid state. So, temperature. Okay, just imagine I have the container on the left. All right, what does temperature do to gas molecules? Anybody know? Huh? Yeah, so temperature, if you increase temperature, they go faster. It turns out temperature is, and we'll, we'll spend a lot of time on this later, temperature is related to kinetic energy. And so if you increase temperature, you increase kinetic energy, and kinetic energy is related to velocity. So really what happens is the molecules move faster, and when they hit the walls, they have more force. They also, also because they have, they're moving faster, they also have higher collisions. So we increase temperature. F 
faster movement, more energy, right? Higher pressure. All right. My hand doesn't want to write. It's worse than usual. I don't know why my hands are really tired. All those pictures I took all weekend. All right. Oop, I didn't mean to do that. So let's go back for a second. So there's a lot of ways that we measure pressure, a lot of different kinds of units. And I'll talk a little bit about more where they come from. Um, but these are this is a handy little like set of relationships, the types of units that we have. Uh, one of the units is a millimeter of mercury, and I'll explain that in a second why it's called a millimeter of mercury. But you'll notice that a millimeter of mercury and a tor are about the same. And if you have 760 millimeters of mercury, that's about one atmosphere of pressure. So atmosphere is the other. Why do we have one? Why do why do pressure of our atmosphere. Typically speaking, when, when you're in on the planet Earth, the pressure is approximately at sea level one atmosphere, and that's where we get it. If the pressure goes up, like if the bar pre barometric pressure goes up, and the pressure is higher, then you can feel that in your body sometimes, because you know, like joints and stuff, mm -hmm. they swell and they, they'll contract based on the air, air, uh, atmospheric pressure. Uh, there are a couple other units that are very should be familiar with you, to you. One is the PSI. What's PSI? Pounds, right? Per square inch. Oh man, this thing's just going crazy on me today. So if you wanted to know like how much pressure you have under your feet, right? You can take your pounds and then take your shoe and calculate its surface area, right? And then just take your pounds and divide it by the square inches of your shoes. And for me, I exert about one atmosphere of pressure. I've done the calculation. I make these things. Yeah, I can, and my feet have flattened out a little bit more, but but yeah, I, I exert, and you probably exert about one atmosphere of pressure underneath your feet. So if you think about that, right, and you can imagine me standing on you, like you laying down and say, okay, Dr. K, do your best, put one atmosphere of pressure on me. I would step up on your chest, and that's one atmosphere of pressure. <laughs> huh? Because we're in one atmosphere of pressure right now, right? Yeah, because the pressure on the inside of the underbar, you know it's also one atmosphere. It's always one atmosphere. Right? And the outside is one atmosphere, the inside is one atmosphere. That's no problem. But if I put one atmosphere of foot with mass on my feet, on top of you, and you're trying to balance that with one atmosphere inside, get two atmospheres of pressure. That's a lot of points. So like when you go deep sea fishing, right? And who's, who's gone deep sea fishing? Just a couple? And you pull that fish way off the bottom? What happens to it? Right. Eyes bulge out. Stomach bladder comes out. Right. That's because they were at much higher pressure underneath all that water. And when you pulled them out, that pressure wasn't there anymore. So now they have one pressure, you know, one pressure on the inside. Like usually two to three atmospheres and one atmosphere on the outside. And everything just comes out of the inside. That's gross. How did you get to balance How? Like a fish? Yeah. Slowly. <laughs> they have a little swim bladder, and they go up, and then the gas is slowly equilibrating. Divers can't go. Like if you're a diver, and I have a little slide on this later. If you're a diver, and you're 30 feet down, and you come up, and you don't let it air out, your lungs will burst. Pop. Uh, I don't know, actually. That would be gross. I'm sure it's happened. I just don't watch those things. So, okay. All right. Let's talk about me uh, measuring pressure. 
And this will get us to the unit of millimeters of mercury. So there's, there's the several ways we measure pressure. Uh, one of them is called a barometer. Um, I'm not going to actually talk about probably what's the most common type of pressure measure that has gauge pressure, but, but we, we, uh, we, measure, we measure pressure in a barometer. And the way a barometer works is you take a long glass tube, okay, traditional barometer, and you fill it up with mercury. But first of all, you have to have a lot of mercury. To do this. And we used to have like lots of mercury around. If you fill up a long glass tube with mercury, you stick your finger on it like this. That might be. Yeah, and then and then and then you flip it over and you stick it in a puddle of mercury. Like a, sometimes people have barrels of mercury, stick it in barrels. But you would just have like a container, like this big. In fact, the the old barometers only had this big of a container at the bottom of mercury. It's about five pounds. Of mercury. You flip it over, stick it in there, and you let go of it. And then what happens is the gas at the top. Or the, the liquid, it starts out up here, it drops, and then eventually it stops. And the reason it stops is because there's atmospheric pressure trying to push up and push the mercury back up here. But the mercury itself is exerting a pressure because of its mass. Right? So it has mass-based pressure, and then the atmospheric pressure is on the outside trying to push that mercury back up. This is a vacuum. So what's inside a vacuum? Hmm? What's inside a vacuum? Trick question. Huh? Matter? Mass? I can't hear you. What? Nothing's in there. It's a vacuum. A vacuum is literally nothing. Sorry, my hearing's so bad. I feel like an old man. Oddly enough, I'm getting closer to being an old man. I was going to go to the doctor today, but things happened. You don't tell me about it either because I can't hear you. They're <laughs> like, you should be going to the doctor. What? Yeah, so atmospheric pressure is pushing down. This pressure is, is pushing, the mercury column is pushing down. And where it typically stops at sea level is 760 millimeters. And that's where this sort of 760 millimeter unit comes from. It's the height of the mercury that it takes to counteract one atmospheric pressure. Now, what happens if the atmospheric pressure goes up? Huh? The mercury goes up. Yeah. If there's more pressure out here, then this gets pushed up. If there's less pressure out here, it goes down. And so it works really well. So like the atmospheric pressure is high, then then this number will be bigger. The atmospheric pressure will be low. That's how we track like weather patterns and stuff. Um, I had a I had a friend. He's a uh, he's a meteorologist, and he works for a news station. He was telling me if there's, I think it's about two millimeters of pressure difference between Las Vegas and San Francisco, we get 25 mile an hour winds. <laughs> because what's happening is, because you have high pressure in one region and low pressure in another, right? And what happens is that air comes down to try to fill that pressure void. And that's when we experience these high winds in the valley, it's just a few millimeters of pressure difference from one end to the other that causes that. Is the same for all the pressures or just mercury? Because it would be seem like really Yeah, dense. all liquids exert pressure. But here's the thing mercury is really dense. So, like, a little thing of mercury that's about this big weighs about five pounds, right? Yeah. But that five pounds of water, you do like three quarters of a gallon. Yeah. So, to exert the same amount of pressure, need way more water than you do mercury. So we use mercury just because you can fit it inside a tube and you can stand in a room. If you did it with water, it would be like uh, 25 meters tall. Yeah, it just would not work. So 
Yeah, all liquids can be, you can do this with any liquid. It's like, it's like uh, like uh, water dispensers for dogs. You put the thing on top, almost like that, uh -huh. and the water that sits on the bottom, and it's like a cap at the top of the cup. Oh, no, that's not what that is, it's just air. Okay, yeah, it's not much. Oh, okay. Uh, Bummer, huh? That would be cool if it was. Well, you do get it here. So, anyway, that's where we get this unit millimeters of mercury. Oh, yeah. The other kind of uh, pressure measurement device we use is called a manometer. And that's what we use for measuring uh, gases that are produced by uh, an experiment. Right? So, we do an experiment and it produces gas. Uh, we use a manometer to capture that pressure difference. So what we would put is we'd put a liquid in here. Now this is not usually mercury, but it can be. And then in here you have a gas reaction. Now you tell me, is the pressure on the inside higher or lower than the pressure on the outside? That'd be higher. Why would you say higher? There's less area. No, but look at this picture. Look at this picture. How do you? How does he know that the pressure on the inside is higher than the pressure on the outside? Yeah, because the liquid would have been pushed down by the pressure, and the other side's higher. And the the pressure of the gas is measured in this height. All right. And then if it's the other way, if the gas, if the, so this particular, if this was a reaction that produced a gas, right, you, that's what would happen. If it's a reaction that consumes a gas, it would go the other way. It would suck up towards the inside because the pressure on the inside would be lower than the outside. So this level would be low and this would be high. The way they start these experiments out typically is they make these the same level. They have a little valve up here and you just open it and equalizes the pressure inside and outside. So it goes flat and you close it and you run your reaction. And then what happens is this will push down, this, this side goes up. Yeah. So that's called a manometer. Um, I usually spell it man-o-meter because that makes people remember it. It has nothing to do with like, um, anyway, it doesn't have anything to do with being a man. But, but it, yeah, it's spelled like man-o-meter. So this is that same table as before. There are a lot of different units. And you'll have to convert, and uh, let me see, do I have some conversion examples? I don't have conversion examples. I'll do a couple of conversion examples on this slide. Um, there are a lot of different units. You'll, you'll have to know how to use them, but I'll give them all to you. Okay. They're given. Um, the, the barometer from the mercury, we have a millimeter mercury. There's also a guy, his name was Torricelli. And Torricelli was pretty famous in terms of gas laws and stuff, so he got a unit named after him. Um, it turns out it used to be that these two were the same unit, uh, but because of the of the SI system and how things got redefined, they're a little bit different. But for the most part, nobody cares about it. If you care about it, this is the difference. It's out in like the sixth or seventh place. Like calculators care, but people don't. So it's kind of right. There's also the Pascal, and the Pascal is the SI unit for pressure. And then there's all pounds per square inch. That's typically what we do uh, uh, day to day. And then, like I said, the tor is essentially the same as the uh, as the SI as the as the uh, millimeter mercury. So let's say you have um, your tire pressure. Is um, I just filled mine up today. Thirty point zero. PSI, calculate the pressure in uh, Pascals. So PA. Make sure that stays up there. Okay, so we use this table a little differently than we have other conversion 
conversion factor tables. Um, but I'll show you, for example, if I have 30 PSI, and I want the, I want the pressure in Pascals, there's 30 PSI. What's the relationship between PSI and Pascals? Right. Well, they're all, these are both equal to one atmosphere, so they're equal to each other. Right. So now what you can do is you can say 14.7 PSI is 101,325 Pascals. Yeah, just from the table. Yeah. And all I'm doing is I'm making the, the bottom part when I want to cancel out this with the number. The top part is this with the number, and I use that to do the conversion. Big number, huh? Well, I want pass pressure and pascals. I'm starting with the PSI. Yeah. Oh, that's just to tell me I'm not talking about it. I'm just writing that. So what so it says, right? Higher pressure is 30.7 PSI, calculate the pressure of Pascal's. This is what I want. And I just write the units to remind myself that's what I'm looking for. That's all. Oh, yeah, and so you get a, a big number. Uh, I'm going to say 2.06 times 10 to the fifth Pascal's. There's also a unit, it's a, called a bar. And it's a thousand pascals is one bar, but as soon as we start talking about bar, everybody gets confused. But yeah, there are all kinds of other pressure units. I just had to use them up on here. Okay, a guy named Robert Boyle. He did this experiment. Uh, this apparatus. This is. Uh, Mid early, well, mid 1600s. So the gas laws have been studied for a long time. One of the things we've studied for the longest in, in chemistry. And he makes this apparatus, and this apparatus is called a J tube. Not that you need to know the name, but you do know how it got its name, right? Look at it. <laughs> Looks like a J. Yeah, it's called a J tube. Right. Now it's sealed at one end. Right. And then on the left side, there's a gas. It, they made it colored in the picture, but it wasn't colored. It was just air. Right. And then he filled it with mercury, and he got the sides to have equal height. So what does he know about the pressure on the inside and the pressure on the outside? They're the same because if it weren't the same, the gas would push the mercury one way or the other. So yeah, we know the pressure is the same. And then what he did is he added mercury to the open end of the J-tube, making sure not to disturb the air that was on the other side. Now what happened to the volume of the gas? It got smaller, right? Now, if we assume that this is one atmosphere, because okay, it's atmospheric pressure, and that you've got 760 millimeters up here, and now it's two atmospheres. How is that in relationship to the volume? It's half, right? And if you have right, two times 760, right, that's two atmospheres of pressure in addition right, to the one atmosphere. That's three atmospheres of pressure. The volume was cut to a third. Right? And so, I mean, Boyle, I just like showing this. He was actually an alchemist. So this is like pre-chemistry times, early 1600s. And there's a, there was a, a group called the Royal Society of Chemistry. Right? So this is the day they actually published his data. And you can go, if you're like really nerdy and you go to like the Royal Institute, you can check this book out of their library and kind of flip through it and see what other things people were doing in the 1600s for research. 
And these were guys that were just kind of like paid money to be scientists. They just, they had benefactors, they lived on estates, they did science. So, um, I have a picture of his, one of his little day-to-day -day journals, right? And on his list, he had to get blood and urine, and these are all things he needed for his experiments, because he was an alchemist, he was trying to extract things from them. It's kind of a weird uh, way to be. But it says, experimental account Right, of the compression of air made by Mr. Boyle, right, that was 1661. But, but what Boyle showed, in essence, is that when pressure goes up, the volume goes down. Right. An alchemist? Oh, you know what an alchemist is? Long story, I'll tell you after. Yeah. How many, al who else doesn't know what an alchemist is? Really? Oh, okay, so. Pre-science, like before scientific method, pre-science, 1600s and earlier, right? People believed that uh, that everything was made up of different elements, but not the same elements that we thought of, think of. They thought of elements like color. They also thought of things like earth, wind, and fire. Like if you could combine earth, wind, and fire, you could get like certain things to come out, right? So this is pre-atomic theory, all that stuff. And so what alchemists did was they literally tried, they were trying to make gold, one of the things they were trying to do. That's what they're famous for. And so, you know, they would look at gold and say, what are the properties of gold? Well, it's really heavy, right? It's dense. It's yellow. What else is it? Shiny, Shiny right? So they thought that they could extract the properties and then combine them with, like, lead and convert it into gold because lead was really cheap. Right, but gold was like was what made kingdoms. Right, if you had a lot of gold, you could be the king of the country. So what the alchemists would do, and they weren't they weren't all very honest, but they needed a way to make a living. So one of their tricks was is they would take a glass rod that was painted, and they would put gold pieces in it, and they would plug it with wax, and then their benefactor would come by, the guy who's paying them to live there. And he had this pot of stuff, like urine and other things, because that's where the, that's the way he was getting the urine, for the yellow color, right? Ew. I don't know. Stirring it around. This pot, it's hot, right? You stir it with a stick. What happens to the stick? What happens to the wax when it gets hot? It melts, right? And what ends up in the bottom of the pot? Gold. Gold. And they're like, oh, look at this. It actually became against the law to make gold at one point in this time period. They actually had a law, you can't make gold. And then what happened was they changed the law. It says if you make gold, it belongs to the crown. Like the king gets the gold if you can make gold. And then they were like, okay, well, everybody can have an alchemist. You can all make gold. The king gets to have his gold. Yeah. It's pretty weird. Um, yeah, there's... A, Another, another, uh, another. Uh, this this might have been a chemist, but I think it was around the time. Of um, you know, because like urine had this like they thought it was like essential. They had things in it essential for life. They would collect it up, like by the bucketful. And I went to a place in Stockholm, and he was a doctor, and uh, just a historical site. He would store. It was and Stockholm. I don't know if you know. It's by the ocean. It's shipyards and stuff. So the sailors would go into the ocean and they'd be sailing. He would have them to collect all their urine up in giant buckets. And then they would bring it to his house and store it under his house. And they just waited to see what would happen. So imagine that you're living in your house and you had like hundreds of gallons of urine underneath your house, slowly evaporating it away. Right? Anyways, long story short, go underneath the house and it's glowing because of the phosphorus that's in the urine, it concentrated down, and at some point, it became what's called phosphorescent, and it emitted light, and so they really thought they had something better. But that's how they discovered phosphorus. Yeah, sailors and their glowing urine. Sorry. What's that? All right, thanks. Don't need to know all these details. 
Yeah, but that's kind of what the alchemists were. They believed not in chemistry, but they kind of believed this kind of magic and chemistry. They were trying to do all kinds of things. That... Um, yeah, so just a little bit about, this is actually Boyle's data. I took it from the paper and I graphed it. But this is what he did. And this is the volume of mercury that he added. You know, it was in that tube. And you can see how as you increase the inches of mercury, that's the pressure, the volume decreased. And so we know that for Boyle's law, Boyle's law is basically this. Pressure times volume is equal to a constant. In other words, if pressure goes up, volume goes down. If volume goes down, pressure goes up. And we say they're inversely proportional to each other. So an inverse proportionality is one where one thing goes up and the other thing goes down, right? Okay. Ex you know, on a, on a molecular level, what we know is that if you increase the pressure, right, the force of this mass will decrease the volume until the force or the pressure is created by the molecules on the inside counteracts the mass that's added onto it. So if you double the force, you're going to half the volume to increase that pressure. That makes sense. And, and what, what does the increased pressure come from? It just comes from more collisions with the wall because the space is now smaller. This is the whole thing about diving, right? Turns out every 10 meters of dive Depth is about one atmosphere pressure. So when you're at the surface, you're experiencing one atmosphere. When you're one, uh, 10 meters down, you're experiencing two atmospheres of pressure. The one that you know, you're used to, and then now the additional pressure of all the water that's on top. It actually becomes harder to breathe because you have to inhale now against two, two atmospheres of pressure unless the regulator provides air at higher pressure. Well, if you hold your breath from here and you come up to zero, right, the volume of in your lungs will double if you hold your breath. That's why if you ever watch those diving shows where people are way down at the bottom and then they come up, there's always bubbles coming out of them. It's not because they're breathing out. It's because they're just letting the air expand out of their lungs. I mean, they are breathing out some. But, yeah, if you, if you hold your breath and you come up, then your lungs will expand and burst. There's also Charles' law. Well, Charles' law was, uh, was an interesting experiment for many reasons. What Charles did is he took a volume of gas, a fixed mass of gas, and he cooled it, and he allowed the vol volume to change as he cooled it. Okay. So, you know, this is... Uh, pretty wide range of temperatures. But you take hot gas, and then you cool it a little bit. This will be its volume. You cool it a little bit. This will be its volume. You cool it a little bit. This will be its volume. This is in degrees Celsius. So this is 0, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 Celsius. It's pretty hot. Okay. Um, the line that you get right, is proportional to the temperature. But the other interesting thing that you get is that as you cool it, if you extrapolate this, and he couldn't go back to these temperatures, but if you extrapolate these lines, they all come to a single point. And that point is when the, the temperature at which these volumes all go to zero. Now think about that. You had a gas, right? And you cooled it, and you cooled it, and you cooled it. Eventually it turned into liquid. Right? You can't you can't cool it anymore and still have it be a gas. So, but but if you if you could cool it all the way down to this temperature, what this graph tells you is the volume of the gas would be zero. Is that even possible? Think about that. Can you actually have zero volume if you had matter to start with? No. So this is really a back then. This was really a hypothetical temperature. It's the temperature at which the volume approaches zero. But now we know it is absolute zero. And it turns out that absolute zero is at minus 273 degrees Celsius. And we call that absolute scale the Kelvin scale. So we call that zero Kelvin. 
Zero Kelvin is the temperature with zero kinetic energy. You can still have some potential energy. It's called a zero point energy, I think, if I remember right. You still have some of that, uh, but it's when the kinetic energy drops. Well, what does zero kinetic energy mean? It's not moving. Yeah. All the way down to the atomic level, things stop moving. Theoretically, it's impossible to get to absolute zero. It had been for years and years and years and years. And somebody screwed it all up. And like four or five years ago, they got below absolute zero. And they're like, I guess it's not so absolute anymore. <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing in physics. Yeah, but what happens at yeah, huh? Yeah, how does that even work, right? It's in, in the way, it has to do with the way you measure temperature and zero having like less energy than the temperature above it. And they somehow get the molecules to invert their energies. I don't have any idea. You could call a physicist and ask them that question. So. <laughs> Ah, oh yeah, so let me write the, let me write, and then we're going to, so I'm going to, I'm telling you all these, and then we're going to do some problems with all of them. So Charles Law um, basically says volume over temperature is a constant. So then if you half the volume, you half the temperature, but the temperature has to be in the Kelvin scale, because if it's not in the Kelvin scale, halving it doesn't make it go half, okay? Because like here... Looking at this graph, this is 50 liters here at 400 Kelvin, 200, uh, sorry, 400 Kelvin, 400 Kelvin, half the temperature, oh yeah, I'm sorry, I wanted to do it with Kelvin, I was, I was looking at Celsius, let's see, what's Kelvin, it's half, this is about half, from here to here, Actually, here to here, that's about halving the temperature, about half the volume. That's the only way it's proportional if it's in the Kelvin scale. If it's in the Celsius scale, then cutting it in half doesn't half its volume. Okay. So we'll use all of these in a little bit. A uh, simple way to think about it, as you cool gas molecules, your kinetic energy drops. Right? Or if you heat gas molecules, your kinetic energy increases. So if you think about like a... Um, balloon, right? And you think about like heating the balloon up, you in your head probably imagine it expands. In fact, it expands because the gas molecules on the inside have higher kinetic energy and they force the walls. So yeah, it just has to do with kinetic energy at collisions. What's that? For the balloon? You said something. Yeah, those are supposed to be balloons. Uh, you could do it with a soda bottle, too, if you just take a regular soda bottle, right? And you heat it up. Don't heat it up a lot, but you heat it up a little bit. You can feel the pressure on the inside increase, but it'll expand because the increase, the pressure is trying to increase. You can feel the expansion. Uh, you put your eyes in, you can see it expand, too, but that's a whole different thing. Okay, don't do that, by the way. Charles Law is uh, then volume and temperature. So one of the things that we can write, just so you can see this, um, because it's equal to a constant, you can write that the volume at one temperature and its temperature are going to be equal to the volume and temperature, the ratio of the volume and temperature. Another temperature. So you can set up an equation and say that right, but do that again. We know that volume divided by temperature is a constant. So let's say I have one set of one temperature and one particular volume. If I change the temperature, that volume and temperature will be equal to the same constant. And because of that, I can make these two things equal to each other. And that's what that equation is. And so what it allows me to do is it allows me to predict how the what the volume will be 
under a different set of temperature conditions or what the temperature will be at a different set of volume conditions. So there's a whole bunch of these. I don't think you need to memorize these, but there's a whole bunch of these. Um, and I'll show you how you can just get them all from one equation. Uh, but there's a, right, Boyle's, Boyle's law, PV is equal to constant, so you can say P1V1 is P2V2. Because they're equal, always equal to the same constant. Charles' law is V over T. So V1 and T1, that's the volume and temperature under one set of conditions, is equal to the volume and temperature under another set of conditions. And there's also the combined gas law, which is PV over T, which you can rewrite like this. And then there's the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law is PV over NT is equal to constant. And you can rewrite it like this. Okay, so I'm not going to make you memorize all this, but I will show you how to do problems out of all these. And really, all of them can be done just out of this one equation. All right, so we're going to take a short break. I'm going to lecture a little bit, and then we'll get started with lab. Because I want to do the example problems. So yeah, so the thing that changed is this. And then um, what do I want? Your yeah, I want a second volume. So I have a volume. And I have a second volume. So identify what changes. You're going to be temperature. Identif uh, and you're looking for volume. So those are the two things that we're dealing with. So then from that, you can identify the gas law. And then you can just apply the gas law to the problem. Okay. So for example, what gas law is that? It's one of the ones. Yeah, V1 over T1 or T1 over V1. doesn't matter. But V over T equals V over T. And then you have to identify which terms go together. Okay? I don't think how you determine which formula you're using. Oh, just by the variables that are in the formula. So, so for example, right, identify what changes. Once you do that, that's how you identify it. You go up to here. All right? It's this one. Oh, okay. Because the only thing's in it. Basically, yeah. Okay. Oh, that makes What's that? Volume. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so then you rearrange it for what you're looking for. Now you're looking for V two in this case. So you're gonna you're gonna say V two is equal to V one over T one times T two like that. And then you just plug stuff in. You have to decide, though, like um, which terms go together, right? So it says 1.55 mils of oxygen is cooled from 95.3 degrees Celsius to 0 degrees Celsius. So what, what are my V1 and my T1? 1.55 and 95.3. Yep. And then T2? This is Okay, so so this comes out to be something like this. Um, V2 is equal to 1.55 milliliters divided by 95.3 plus 273.15 Kelvin times uh, 273.15 Kelvin. That's the temperature of zero degrees Celsius in Kelvin. It has to always be done in Kelvin. Okay. So this, right, has to be in Kelvin. So a lot of times in these problems, I don't convert the number first. I just write it like that. And then if I do the calculation, I write the number next to it. That way, like, if I go back and I'm trying to figure out, like, what I did wrong in a problem, I can see what I did wrong. To what? The middle one? Yeah. Because that's what I'm solving. Okay. Okay. So that, that's basically how all these empirical gas law problems are done. We'll do another one. Yeah, because you have to remember to go from Celsius, right, to Kelvin. So Kelvin is equal to Celsius plus 273.15. Uh, 
And, and if it's zero degrees Celsius, then it's just two seventy. Oh, is that the equation of this? Sorry, you're right. Oh, yeah, I worked it out already. Oh. But I wrote it like you expected to see it from the equation. That's actually how I do the problem. I just took the proportions of temperatures and multiplied times the volume. But yeah, it comes out the same answer. So when you do that, yeah, that'll give you 1.149 mLs. Whoa, what happened there? Oh, I got to the edge. I must hit the scroll bar. So is that the Kelvin that cancels out? Yeah, the Kelvin will cancel out. And 1.149 mLs, that's two sig figs. So that's 1.15 milliliters. Do another one. So does the bacterial culture isolated from sewage, nice, produce 41.3 milliliters of dry methane at 31.0 degrees Celsius? And that's a cow's temperature, I think. And 750 milliliters of mercury. What is the volume at STP? So STP is a definition. It's one atmosphere and zero degrees Celsius, okay. STP. Stands for standard temperature and pressure. It's just, a lot of times we'll convert uh, gases, uh, volumes and stuff to those temperatures so we have something we can prepare. Okay, so let's see, what, what's, what is the first thing we wanna do? Find what your find the um, identify what changes. changes right. So I have that's a volume, right? That's a temperature, and that's a pressure. And then STP implies a pressure and a temperature. Right? And then I'm looking for a volume. P T. So the variables are exactly P, T, and V. This is combined gas law. If you flip, yeah, P times V over T. But you said you'll give us those, right? Yeah, but it turns out you'll just remember them at some point. But yeah, there'll be a table of them. Okay. Um, in fact, I'll show you a way that if you just remember one, you can get them all. Okay. Okay. So P1, V1 over T1 is equal to P2. 2v2 over t2, like that. And then um, I have to solve it for the variable that I'm looking for, so v2. I don't know why I chose v2 for both these problems, sorry. So it's going to be p1v1 over t1 times uh, t2 over p. So I just cross multiplied and then divided and got that. <laughs> Good. I was gonna I was just about to put an arrow that says do math here. But, well, I mean that's what I was gonna say. So so this is like I don't know I don't know how you guys are taught to do these things, so um, I'm always a little leery about doing intermediate steps because then we get in this long argument about, oh, well, I do it like this. I'm like, well, that's fine. <laughs> okay. It should come out the same answer, right? Just, But that's the thing I try to avoid is that long argument about doing math differently. I'm like, it's math. Just do it. and you get. Okay. So this is how I learned how to do it. If it's on the bottom on one side, it's on the top on the other. If it's on the top on one side, it's on the bottom on the other. So basically, say so now, see, I'm going to get this argument. <laughs> this is going to go up, and this is going to this is going to go down. Just the just these variables. So so I want to keep this by itself, right? All right. So that means if it's this is on the bottom, where should it be on, on the other side? Top. So it's going to be up here. Because I'm multiplying by T2 on both sides, right? So like the, the long way to do it is this, right? Yeah. Okay. But 
But that's the, this is, no, but the, here, think about this. This is going to make your life so much easier if you can have this make sense to you. Because you don't spend all that time writing and canceling stuff. That's the way math teachers want you to learn how to do it. Okay? <clears throat> if the T2 is at the bottom down here, then I'm multiplying by it on the other side. So that means I cross it out and I write T2 like that. And then you divide by over. Yeah, so I'm going to ask her. P2 is on top, right? But I want to get V2 by itself. So where does the P2 have to end up? Down. Down. So you guys are right like this. It's P2. And then you cross it out and it's done. What? Oh, so what I usually do is, again, because I'm not a math teacher, that part I didn't screw around with, so I left it exactly the way it was, and I just put the stuff I screwed around with on the other side. I put it off by itself. You can put it all together if you want. The P2 over everything? Everything over the PT? Yeah, you could if you want to. You could just take this line and go like this, and it means the same thing. See, I just extended the line. Just do this. But this way, I don't screw up by like inserting a bunch of stuff into what I originally had. And so that's the way I do it. See what happened? We had this long discussion about how I did it. <laughs> you knew it was going to happen. But you knew how to do it already, I think. You just, it took you longer is all. OK, so now what I have to do is I have to identify all my variables. And what I'm going to tell you to do is this. Write this out, P, V, N, and T. Those are all the possible variables. And we're going to go 1 and 2. That's every variable that you can have. If you look at the gas law equation, that's every variable that you can have. Okay. And then fill out the table. So um, the pressure, P, well, let's do P1. Right. What's P one? Yeah, seven fifty three. Now I'm gonna put units down here. These are millimeters of mercury. And in these problems, the only thing that matters is that the units are the same. Later we're gonna to have to convert it to different units, but for now we can just make sure they're the same. So what's V one? And we didn't do N, right? So I'll just cross it out. And then what's T? But it has to be in Kelvin, right? Yeah. So I just write it like that. Now, what's P2? So, STP? Mm -hmm. What is ATM? One ATM, but is that the same units? No. So what unit do I have to use? Mercury. Millimeters of mercury, right? And so I'm going to put 760, because that is one atmosphere. So the units have to be the same. And what, what's, uh, what's V2? Yeah, it's what I'm looking for, right? And what's T2? Yeah, 273.15. Always has to be Kelvin. But the other ones just have to be the same. So here's the deal. Now that you have your equation, V2 is equal to T2 over P2 times uh, P1 times V1 over T1, right? You just have to plug the numbers in. Right, so T2 is this value, right? P2 is this value. So you just go through the table and you just plug the numbers in one at a time and then you do the calculation and be done. Now I organized mine a little more nicely down here, but it's the same thing. It comes out to be, I'm not gonna plug the numbers in, I'll let you do that, 36.75, wait, uh, 36.8 uh, milliliters. Oh, I rearranged the numbers, and you can see how all the units cancel out. Easier, right? 
millimeters of mercury. Millimeters. It's just the same equation. I just moved things around. Okay, so if I were to put it in the exact equation that... If you were to plug it into here, you'd get this number just the same. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm just showing, like, if you, if, you, if you really rearrange it and look at it as pressures and temperatures times the volume, then all these units cancel out, and you're left with no, no liters. Honestly, that's how I do the problems. I just think of ratios, and I just plug numbers in, and I do the problems. Okay, that's enough for today. Okay, a couple of things I have to go over, and. Um,